Barriers Empowering Women in Tech and International Women's Day special webinar led by the editorial team of CI Leader. Hi, I'm Nisha Sharma, Principal Correspondent at CI Leader and your host for today's session. While women have made significant strides in diversifying workplace roles traditionally associated with men, their representation in the IT and the technology sector remains low, accounting for just about a quarter of roles. This disparity becomes more visible when considering leadership roles within the IT field. For instance, in the 14th edition of Next 100 Award, hosted by the 9.9 .9 group out of 1,037 IT applicants, only 8% of women professionals were the winners. The issue doesn't lie solely in reaching the top, rather it's the disproportionately low number of female applicants, constituting just 12% of the total candidates. In our interaction and knowledge exchange with the, some of the prominent women IT leaders of the industry, we would like to delve deeper into, the, into their career growth, achievements, leadership style, challenge, IT priorities, and the way forward of women in tech, aiming to inspire action and foster growth for future generation. Once again, representing the 9.9 .9 group, I would like to thank all the past CR panelists and the audience for joining us today and sharing their valuable experiences and insights on this special day. Let's meet our panelists for the session. We have Pooja Chatrat, CIO at OnQuest Laboratories Limited, is a visionary technology leader known for driving digital transformation and fostering collaborative team cultures. Next, we have Vitali Sharma, Director Risk compliance and information security at SDG Corporation brings extensive expertise in risk management, privacy, and governance of information security. Next, we have Mahajavi, CIO for Raychamp RPG Overseas IT Strategy Operations, focusing on charting strategic technology roadmaps for our digital first organization. Next, we have Shobna Lele, CIO at the Bombay Dying and Manufacturing Company Limited, has over two decades of experience across various technology and industry domains. And last but not the least, we have Shweta Shivasta, head IT for Matrix Fertilizers and Chemicals Limited. She is a digital transformational professional with a strong focus on business growth through technology. A warm welcome to all the panelists for joining us today. We will start by exploring the existing barriers in impending women's progress in tech role. So as per the survey done in 2023, there are only 29% of women employees account of India's total pool of tech employees. Mahajabeen, can you discuss this, the reason behind this? As in why do we have a dearth of uh, women professional at senior uh, levels, Anisha, right? So, uh, yeah, so uh, I think women in uh, uh, the labor force used to be a problem at some point of time where the representation of gender diversity itself was a huge um, uh, ask and there used to be a gap. But uh, as women enter the workforce, uh, we see the percentage increasing more and more and more. But still, we do see that majority of the women who are there in the workforce, uh, they either remain... Uh, kind of uh, segregated at the junior to the middle management level. And as we keep moving upwards, the funnel seems to get tighter and tighter. Uh, in fact, uh, if you have to ask me being a woman in this space myself, uh, we are a handful of us. I think we know 90% of each other. Whenever we are at a conference, we know uh, majority of the faces which are there. There have been conferences in the past where the organizers would want to have a 50-50% representation of men and women, but they are not able to get as many women. And if it's a room full of 150 odd participants, there would be one round table which would be, you know, filled with uh, uh, women leaders. So yes, it's very stark. It's very evident that there is a dearth, uh, but it's also a function of a lot of uh, factors which exist. Uh, it can be the sociocultural reasons, but it's also uh, the way um, a culture places a bit of a unfair responsibility of the majority of uh, the family obligations on women, which kind of make it very difficult for them to choose if the situation comes, if they have to make a choice between a career uh, and uh, responsibilities. 
uh, and most of the times we do see that that particular onus falls onto women. Uh, it also does happen that uh, due to childbearing or rearing or all of those factors, women are the ones who kind of drop out of the workforce much faster than uh, their male counterparts would. And that also kind of impacts the credibility of the women workforce of sticking around or being more reliable uh, when given you know, a job or a task that would require the organization uh, to believe that the person is going to stick around. So the opportunities kind of get lesser. And even if an opportunity comes that way, sometimes the women are not confident to pick it up, but sometimes the situations do not allow. So as you move up, obviously your commitment towards your work uh, has to increase. And uh, if there is a question of balancing between work and family, for a woman, most of the time, it's the family. Uh, so of course, I mean, these are the reasons that the higher up you go, unless you have a very, very strong support system in place, uh, you are not able to do it. I don't think it has got anything to do with potential or acumen or aptitude of women. If you go to any school or colleges, you will see, you know, the women, the girls always scoring better than the boys. So discipline or acumen or aptitude is never the reason, but I think it has got more to do with how our, you know, culture is woven and how the support system around us is to kind of support women to be able to get into higher positions. I agree. Like, so we are in 2023, like still we are, we are getting many things like women are getting more representation and empowerment, but they are some barriers still there are some barriers because people expect women to be like they have if they are elder they have to take care of their family the, the people expect their, them to like take care of their family their, their family should be their first priority and after that the career should be on a lighter note even if you get to 2050 or 2060 maternity leave to humble anybody leave. so right. that break even the offices are like women. they are accepting this thing like uh, they are giving paternity leave also but yeah but how long and there are some um, uh, some women wants to be like financially support their family or some so they have to manage both the things uh, if we talk about the men they are like they can work whenever they want they, people the whole family will support them for to concentrate on the work but for the like for women it, the case is different so not <laughs> delving into more into it so we will talk about the it governance so can you discuss your approach to it governance and how it supports both innovation and operational reliability the other day, I was sitting with a certain group of I mean, CIOs and we were discussing what keeps us up at night. And my first response was security. And somebody from the BFSI sector just kind of jumped on me and said, no, it is governance. I said, RBI can notice. So <laughs> the thing is that governance is something which is like the center stage of life for you know everybody in terms of uh, it definitely is a very very important aspect of what we do and uh, yes there is always a balancing uh, a scenario sometimes uh, doing things without keeping the governance or maybe kind of finding a tweak is much easier uh, but yes um, so for example if we have to do uh, you know, something with respect to digital. Digital is something which is happening everywhere right now. And there are so many vendors that you will get options uh, starting from very lower range of commercial engagement to a very higher range of commercial engagement. But then if you have to kind of do a check on all the governance aspects. So for example, the governance today would say that if you are taking a SaaS product, you need to have a SOC certified vendor. Uh, but if you have to go and look for a SOC certified vendor, they will come at a way more premium than a small time vendor would be who might probably do the project for you at one tenth of the cost. So for many organizations, it becomes a question of do I need to do the digitization or do I need to take care of the governance um, uh, piece of it? Uh, because it's an inherent risk which lies over there. So it's always a balance which we have to kind of figure out in terms of what the business is uh, because we can never... Uh, take governance lightly. Um, being from a manufacturing industry and having worked with BFSI in the past, so governance has been a huge aspect of our uh, lives. Uh, it is something, uh, you know, you have, I think more than anything else, audit is something which is always there in our lives. If it's internal audit or external audit or statutory audit or some other audit, 
is something that doesn't go away. So yes, the focus on governance is high and we try to kind of balance it out with respect to uh, what we want to do in terms of uh, uh, business uh, automation. Great, great, great approach. I like, I really appreciate your like the way you are discussing this thing. So my next question would be about as you are succeeding as a CIO, women CIO especially. So what advice would you give to aspiring IT professionals looking to become a CIOs, especially in the industry as diverse as PCAM RPG operates? Gyan kam do, kam zada karu. Uh, it's something that I would basically tell people. I think all of us here who are there in the panel, um, we all have kind of come from a place where we have done a lot of, we have dirtied our hands and that's how we have learned things and we have come up. We have never shied away uh, from, you know, doing something on the pretext that, okay, I have probably done a master's or I'm an MBA or I'm an engineer and this is something which doesn't fit my profile or my job. You always learn things when you're doing it yourself and there is no better way to learn and grow in life than to actually start from the grounds up. So uh, a lot of people who we meet today are a lot of new generation or the Gen Z uh, that we meet. They do have a lot of good ideas. They have a lot of appreciation for digitization and the new age technologies and all of that. But a lot of it just comes from theory or from reading a lot of stuff but none of them really want to kind of, you know, get their hands dirty, work and do the real uh, things uh, on the ground. So I have a very simple advice for everyone that uh, yes, acceptance and appreciation of the new edge tech is great and uh, aspiring for it is also great, but uh, please get to the ground, understand the ground and get your hands dirty with respect to the work. There is no work in this field, which is small or big. You will only learn uh, when you will get your hands dirty. So that's that's the way to uh, grow. Thank you so much. So now we have Pooja Chatra from OnQuest Libraries Limited. So Pooja, uh, as you have been working for a long time and there are we, now people are talking about their mental peace at workplace. So what things uh, takes to the tea at the workplace? Uh, first of all, thank you, Nisha, for making me part of this panel. And uh, thank you to CIO and Leader Group as well for inviting us. And especially the panel, as Mezabin also mentioned, we we all meet so much and we are such a close group. So it's not looking like that we are on a professional panel. It's a kind of thing wherein we can discuss openly and talk as women leaders. So thanks for that. And people... Uh, Maybe that was earlier also, but yes, somehow with the help of Google and AI coming up and chat GPT and other tools as well. So not to be mentioned. So uh, everybody these days think that they, they know IT. They understand IT very well. Uh, they The approach that they come with, with the problem statement itself, they first Google the things and then they come to us and then they think about that now whatever we'll give an answer first thing is that you have to revert back instead of listening so active listening skill which which should be there that's actually i think is missing now not only with Gen Z, it's with i would say 80 percent of the people in the organization which is happening so everybody is there with their questions and and that too with a bouncing back kind of questions that is coming up so what i i would advise is that yes it is good to increase your knowledge through these tools for sure. But uh, if we have dirtied our hands and if we have reached to this level or any of the person who has reached to this level, for sure, they understand criti uh, criticality of the solution and they also understand the solution from all the fronts. Security like these days is very important. We can surely get a work done from a vendor which can offer us a tool in 10 lakhs versus vendor which is which is offering us a tool in 50 lakhs. So apple to apple comparison can be made only if we evaluate all the parameters. So that is one of the major criteria that we need to work upon. So everybody is thinking that we we know IT. So that that's actually the biggest problem that I've been also facing and I'm sure most of the leaders would be facing in today's world because a lot of information is flowing. And this is not only related to IT, I would say 
this could also be in relation to medicine field also because being a part of healthcare industry uh, what i have observed as a consumer as well as being a part of, of a cio for a healthcare industries as soon as we get a report we first google it and check it ke ye parameters hain so this is this would be the result and we think all big big things this this disease has happened because every second thing that leads to is cancer these days that is what i have observed with myself also so instead of that we should actually trust the people who are actually the domain experts and let them work and let us everybody around should let them work uh, that that would be my advice so i'll move on to our your expertise so pooja with the evolving landscape of business intelligence and data analytics where do you see the significant growth or change and how are you navigating these so uh, as we talk about bi or business analytics and especially in the healthcare sector so i would say there there's a big change that has been uh, there and covid somehow uh, has been a big game changer for healthcare industry especially wherein uh, instead of what we used to do earlier uh, except for that now we are doing predictive analytics that is one thing that we are doing and uh, this is helping us a lot in making the decisions like like we say we are promoting predictive testing so initially people used to go and get the test done once doctor is diagnosing something and all whereas now the culture is changed wherein you are getting your testing done on regular basis as a health checkup so that kind of uh, thinking which is which is changed and here what is happening is uh, analysis of data is helping a lot so internally like we talk about when we do predictive analytics it not only helps us uh, our sales team it is also helping us uh, helping the marketing team as well to make the right decisions now uh, again bi is again helping in giving the personalized medicines i would say because when you take preventive measures and you you have uh, the entire detail of the patient so you you can give a per the healthcare can provide a personalized medicine also integration of ai and machine learning is something that we are very closely working based on the data that we are getting the huge data that we have and basis on that that we are working with we are able to share a lot of data uh, which we have gathered from different systems so herein i would say the bi is helping a lot internally in the organization which actually uh, was not there prior to when when we have implemented this that's a great thing great answer so i'll move on to my next question to you like continuous improvement is a crucial for success so how do you incorporate feedback mechanism into your, your project and can you share your few examples where feedbacks led to significant as it will help our like for aspiring cios like what would you suggest them and how you have overcome so a uh, feedback is something that uh, i have always appreciated for myself as well and for my team also so since start when i was a team leader or a project manager and going forward different parts feedback has been one important thing that has helped me a lot to grow as well as that has helped i think my team members also to grow so feedback that's why i keep on giving a lot of uh, emphasis on the feedback mechanism and we have defined a lot of systems also internally to capture this feedback mechanism so uh, basically what i believe is that first thing before capturing the feedback mechanism is defining our goals and objective actually what kind of feedback we want what is our goal so once that is defined basis that only you can move to the next step which is again then identifying your stakeholders so uh, you need to have your right stakeholders it's not like uh, that you have a problem statement and you try to get feedback from people who are actually not related it so feedback would would be of no help so for us if we talk about if we are running any campaign or if you are getting any new test in the market so for us at that time feedback is a clients who are actually 
going to use it or internal team members on which we have focused for that test. So that kind of thing or the subject matter experts internally in for that domain. So that is the way we define the feedback mechanism. Now post this, once this is identified, uh, the next step for us is uh, choosing the appropriate channel. How would we like to communicate this? It could be through SMS, WhatsApp, so different communication channels through mail. We want to uh, float it on our LinkedIn, uh, social media. So how do we want to communicate it to our stakeholders? So that is also one important thing that we uh, work a lot. And uh, once this part is done, now next step comes is when you have the data with you, how actually you're responding to that feedback. So uh, sometimes it happens is people don't appreciate the feedback. If I talk about, as you mentioned, I give an example. So if I talk about IT itself, we are building an app and we just did a pilot internally for a sales team for a small chunk, which is Gurgaon area or Delhi NCR. Now, if the user is giving us feedback that this is not user friendly. So uh, that time itself, as the owner of the application, we need to take a call and we need to create the modification. We need to do that modifications in the app, which could be helpful for the user. So that simplicity, because that user would be using it every day instead of this. Now, what happens sometimes is uh, because we created the app, we take that feedback negatively. So that is actually the destructive point, which, which I appreciate. Uh, and I inform my team that we don't need to uh, bother about. The more we take the feedback constructively, that will be helpful for us. So this is... And we should give the, op if somebody is giving us the feedback, we should respond to that feedback very po in a positive manner, as well as rather sometimes people uh, shy giving the feedbacks, maybe the other person doesn't like it or not. Rather, we should reward. I internally, when we do some kind of testing, I tell my uh, mem uh, team members that if if you find maximum errors, this person would be rewarded. So so that our testing is successful. So that's that's the approach that we follow. Uh, thank you, Pooja. My pleasure. Yeah. So now we have Mitali Sharma from STG Corporations. Hi, Mitali. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Nisha. Thank you for inviting us in this, uh, you know, in this wonderful panel and giving us this opportunity. Thank you. So now I would turn to like uh, about the long-term solutions of it. So as the average global average cost of data breach in 2023 was 4.45 million U US dollars. That is a 15% increase over three years. So Mitali, how do you protect digital assets and data privacy in your projects or organization? Right. So, um, Anisha, I think, uh, you know, you, you rightly gave those statistics, but going further with those statistics, I think if you look at, uh, you know, some of the uh, breach investigation reports, like whether it is from Verizon, Forrester, any of those, you would see that, you know, there have been a, a lot of data breaches in the past uh, two to three years since the time COVID started that has increased. Even the ransomware attacks have increased. And... Um, I mean, even if those attacks are not there, I think the first, first and the foremost thing is, uh, you know, protecting your own port. So even if you go to, I mean, if you are going outside your house, you will make sure that your house is protected. Similarly, organization, if you are the person who is there, who is bearing that flag, uh, you have to make sure your port is protected. And in order to do that, I would suggest that, you know, we follow a principle uh, and that's that's not something which is from the books, but it's a WHOM or the whom principle. Uh, and where, you know, W starts with what you need to protect. So first of all, you need to identify what are those crown jewels of your organization? What is the threat landscape? What is the risk appetite of your organization? What are my assets? What are my critical assets? What are those things that I really need to protect? What is the risk landscape, threat landscape of my organization? So first thing you need to start with that W. Next is your H, which is how you would protect it. So what controls should I have in place? It can be in the form of my policies. It can be in the form of some, um, you know, tools, technologies that I am uh, putting. It can be in the form of trainings. So what I, I'm going to protect, how I'm going to protect, then you move on to O, which is the owners. Who are the owners for this or the stakeholders or the custodians for it? And 
you know, whenever you talk about information security, cyber security, there is a statement everybody gives that humans are the weakest link in the chain. And even, you know, if you look at all these reports, you would see statistics like 80% of the data breaches was due to human element involved into it. So, which clearly shows that, you know, people feel that humans are the weakest link. But then if you want to really success uh, succeed in your information security program, if you really want to bring that into the DNA of the organization and not just make it a checkbox approach, uh, I think they have to be your strongest link. Every human being or every person in your organization should be the custodian of information security. As you know, most of the standards also talk about information security should not be owned only by the CISO of the organization or the board. It needs to go to the NS level and it has to be everybody's responsibility. Everybody has to be custodian of it. So uh, you move from WHO and then last but not least, you go to M, which is monitoring. So you have you have put the controls in place. You know who the owners are. But are you actually monitoring your controls and making sure that, you know, based on your changing landscape, based on the uh, changing threats, are you making modifications to it? Are you monitoring it, making sure that, you know, uh, certain tests are going on? Like, for example, are you making sure that your business continuity plans are current? Or was it a plan that was made maybe for an ISO 27001 audit and every year? You would just look at it and say, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. This is good. This is good to go. But then are you looking at it whenever there is a change in your environment? So I think that's uh, basically the principle that I would follow and that I would recommend organizations to follow. Really appreciate it. So now I'll move on to my next question to you. Like recently, the, uh, the Indian, cabinet, Indian Union Cabinet has passed the DPDP bill. Right. So... If I'll talk about this, how will the DPDP bill will reshape the digital privacy and consumer rights and what quality should organization look for in a, a data protection officer? Because it's like it's become necessary for every organization to comply, to comply right. effectively. So, um, you know, so the three pillars of information security have always been CIA, which is confidentiality, integrity and availability. Uh, there is also a fourth dimension that we generally talk about in, in some terms because all of it is related to P, which is privacy. And now with this bill, I think uh, in India, it has become more regulated that, you know, privacy has to be followed. It was always there, uh, whether you talk about GDPR, you talk about California Privacy Act, any of those, they, it was always there protecting your data. At the end of the day, you are designing all your controls in your environment to protect data and data and its confidentiality. So. Data privacy has always been there. With this act, it's more like a stamp. It's more like a regulation. It's more like a mandate for organizations to follow it. And um, what it uh, also gives is it gives the right to the consumer to say, where are you using my data? Like, you know, a lot of uh, when, when the market is unregulated, what happens is that people look at your data. They would sell it to somebody else. That somebody else would misuse it. You will start getting calls. Uh, like, you know, a lot of times we'll get calls saying that, you know, somebody has taken your uh, Aadhaar card and custom is taking uh, and, you know, your products are stuck in customs or your or there, there will be some marketing calls going on. And we as Indians, uh, we don't care too much about our data. How many times we would have gone to Google Play Store and there is a long, you know, before you want to download any app because it's a free app, it will it will give you a long list and we'll just say, I agree. I don't think anybody ever reads it. I mean, it's a very long one and we feel, oh my God, I just have to make notes. Come on, yeah, this is only a game I have to play. And we just accept it. But then, you know, in a way, we were giving a consent saying, yes, I'm good with everything, right? Uh, now, it's, it's, uh, it's more on the consumer right that the organizations would have to think what data they are collecting. And even us, like, Maybe for us, it would not change because we will still hit that accept button. But then, and we will still say, if I have to read an article, I'll still say accept all cookies. But then for the organization, it becomes important to understand what they are going to do with that data, how they are going to protect it. If they are having a lot of times, you know, organizations would have data breaches, their data would be compromised. Some of them would report it. Some of them would not even report it, thinking that it is not necessary. But now, you know, reporting of data 
data breaches, making sure that you know you are uh, putting the data in the right way, you have right controls in place. That becomes even more even more mandatory with this bill or with this act coming in. There are fines that are there up to around 250 crores to 200 crores for different aspects. So if you are not doing all this, then you know there are fines that have to be there. So to start with, you have to first understand what all data is there in your environment, how that data is structured, what controls are in place, how would you protect it, what mechanisms are in place to control it, how you are retaining that data, how the data discovery is happening. So a lot of those stuff would now become mandatory, which was more like a uh, you know kind of a, a okay, okay thing where organizations are saying, yes, we do it. But do they actually do that data discovery, data management and data retention? was never checked because it was not mandated. And um, so when this act will come in, definitely, you know, they introduce a new role, which is the data privacy officer or the data protection officer. And you would need that DPO in, in you know, your organization. So it's not that you will have to hire a new person. It's a designated person whom you can appoint as the privacy officer. And uh, that was also a mandate for GDPR. Like even for GDPR, you need to have that. And generally, you know, some of the compliance officers would play that role. Organizations would now take this role a little seriously because it is mandated. Earlier, it was like, okay, come on, tum ye role kar lo, tum bhi kar lo. Right? It was more like that. Now it will be like, you need to have that dedicated role. And with that role, uh, you know, the person who is taking up that role needs to understand what is data privacy? What is the protection of data? Apart from all these people miss about the incident management and the business continuity aspect of data. So once, you know, let's say you are breached, right? I always say either you are breached or you don't know that you have been breached. So it's one of those two cases where you are. And the same is with your data as well. So, um, you know, the, the DPO or the officer should know how do I react or how do I act once, you know, the data is breached. What are the mechanisms that I follow? What would be my incident response plan? What would be the backup strategy? How we would recover and how we would start again? So I think those would be some of the qualities that would be really required. And uh, I think this bill is really going to make a lot of change in the entire landscape of the regulations and the and not just this bill, but I think uh, if you look at the regulations with the ransomware attacks and the attackers being more intelligent, the standards have also undergone a lot of change in the last two years. If you look from uh, 23 till date, you would see a lot of standards have undergone new versions, which were long back, long pending. Uh, you look at ISO 27001, it launched its 2022 version in November. You look at NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, it just recently launched its 2.0 version, which was like long pending. Uh, the DPDP Act definitely is a big thing. And you would also see NIST uh, launching some more standards coming up. They are re revising a lot of their standards. PCI DSS came up with their new standard, which is 4.0. So a lot of uh, changes in regulations are also happening. And HIPAA, okay. HIPAA. Yeah, one of them is HIPAA, which is the protection of health information. That has yeah. also changed recently. Yeah, still DPDP, DPDP bill is new. So yeah. we have a lot more to see and how companies are adopting it because well, it's sometime really... back gdpr was also new but then you know yeah uh, it has been uh, enforced very nicely so we have to wait and we'll see so thank you mitali thank you for like uh, enlightening us now we have shobna lele from bombay dying so shobna like moving forward to our discussion you have built and managed high performing it teams so how do you ensure and they remain motivated and aligned with the organization's objective? Could you share your key lessons for your from your experience? Yeah. Hi, uh, and uh, glad to be part of this uh, panel. Um, so I think uh, the final functioning of any department is defined by the kind of teams that it has. Uh, the main thing I think for a team management or a team motivation is to first ensure that the team is aligned to a common goal. Uh, many a time, the team workers, if they're working in silos and looking at different objectives or a different goal, then uh, the team falls apart. So I think it is really important first to have a common goal or a common 
objective that the team is working for. Once that common objective is realized, then each team member knows that you know all of us are working to the same common goal, and hence the conversations, the dialogues, or the debates are more healthier than what would have otherwise been. Uh, you know, a more or uh, you know an argument or uh, an aggressive kind of a debate. So uh, that is one. The second thing within the team is each team has uh, each team member rather has their own skills and uh, you know their own roles that uh, you know they play. So I think it is important to uh, make them realize the kind of role that they are playing within the team. So although the entire uh, outcome would be a team outcome, but you know each individual has a role to play within that team. and uh, it is important for them to understand what the kind of role they are playing and uh, why that role is important i think uh, that keeps them motivated because they know that it is their performance which is finally going to lead to the outcome of the uh, team uh, and uh, finally i would also say that as managers you know we also have to be a bit of psychiatrist you know to understand you know what are the undercurrents that are going on in the team uh, so a lot of times things which look very nice and very calm uh, at the top have a lot of undercurrents which are actually going on uh, you know some conflicts which are not really coming up you know they they are being hidden uh, uh, i think that is where the skill of the manager comes into picture where the managers are able to understand that there are actually conflicts which are not being spoken about very uh, you know easily but uh, and uh, address once you realize that these conflicts are there you address them so you give them a way of actually putting out these grievances to you and uh, a way to address them Uh, I think with these uh, in mind, I think the the team performance will definitely uh, be uh, at a high. Uh, one because it's at a common goal. Uh, the entire team is working for a common goal, right? And uh, uh, there is also conflict management process, a formal or an informal. Okay, depending on the type of the team uh, that you have, that that is laid in place. I think that will definitely help uh, to manage and uh, motivate the team. Finally, I think one more point is uh, it is also important that each of the same team members has a connect with some of the business leaders or the senior management within the organization. So it uh, I al- always encourage you know, most of my team members to go and speak to people who are higher up uh, in in our uh, business or higher up in the senior leadership because that's when they also get a very realistic picture about the objectives of the organization. Me talking about the objectives versus a business leader talking about the objectives of the organization makes a vast difference. and uh, that's why i think it's, uh, it's definitely pertinent that uh, you know the team members are encouraged to go and speak to the uh, other team uh, business leaders uh, as well as other peers uh, within their uh, uh, departments or other yeah i agree and for me like the transparency in the team and the like motivating each other is the main key to build our like have a successful and a bonded team for any business right. so my next question would, would be about if we talk about the technological investments how do you prioritize and what criteria do you use like what uh, parameters do you use to evaluate new technic uh, technology opportunities for your company right so i think we are in an age of a, a rapid you know technology transformation you know that of the rapid technology transformation so first and foremost is uh within the it community we have to be a little vigilant about the new technologies that are coming okay and what are the tech, what are the uh, things that are actually relevant to your organization so we don't adopt technology for the sake of the technology but technology for the sake of business right so any technology that has a very clear business outcome i to i don't think we really need to prioritize it becomes an easy uh, you know uh, business case for the organization to adopt right a case where you Have a business value or a business outcome clearly defined, either in terms of an ROI or in terms of a CPO, the total cost of ownership. I think that's a very, very clear and a easy case. I think the real issues are where you do not have a very clear cut case of an ROI or a CPO, but you still need to do a technology investment. Uh, example could be for some something like security initiative. Now, a security initiative may not exactly have a, a business outcome or a business value. I think so. The uh, approach there would be. Uh, rather than defining the outcome you you define what if you don't you know do that specific investment and i think that's where the risk management or the uh, you know the risk management matrix that every organization maintains comes into picture right so to prioritize these kind of investments always i use the risk management uh, you know principles that uh, what if you don't invest in a security protocol or why uh, in a specific so i think that gives a very clear cut idea to the organization as to what are the risks that the organization will face 
if they don't do this kind of an investment. So then it becomes a conscious call that the organization takes uh, also in terms of the probability. So uh, the risk management matrix always helps you to do a very scientific analysis about the probability of the risk happening and the, you know, what happens if the risk actually, you know, takes place or that event actually takes place. So I think that's one of the ways so you can uh, you know, prioritize technology investments uh, within the organization. Hi everyone, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is Jatinder. I'm <clears throat> extremely, I, I've been hearing uh, some great thoughts, uh, Nisha's colleague <clears throat> and uh, managing the editorial operations of CI leader. Uh, sorry to interject. I know uh, it's a webinar is especially ex uh, designed exclusive for women and apologies for being the only man present. <laughs> However, I dare to interject to ask a specific question. <clears throat> we, uh, <clears throat> we have been uh, focusing on workplace gender equality uh, and of course, you know, being uh, uh, women leadership at top. But over the, I mean, despite all these initiatives, <clears throat> we have been witnessing uh, uh, an evident gap. Still, there is an evident gap uh, in terms of uh, in terms of women's participation, especially at the top. So, uh, so what do you think? What are the th uh, three key things that you believe can increase women's representation in IT leadership? Uh, that could basically, you know, give equal rewards, resources, and opportunities regardless of gender. So, any one of you, so that could be of, you know, great insight. So, one thing I would like to add in this is that uh, women uh, would reach to the top level if we have the kind of facilities that they require at the middle level is available. What happens is uh, there's a big career break that is happening at the mid level. And that's the reason because at that time, family as well as career, both are important. And somehow what, uh, because women's uh, responsibility, and especially if I talk about India culture, so if the responsibility has been like that, that children, parents, in-laws, everything, house, your entire family. So that becomes a major responsibility for the women. So deciding at that time whether she'll be prioritizing home or whether she'll be prioritizing her career that's that's one thing major thing and uh, surely if there is a proper mentorship wherein women can guide women or maybe men men can be two good mentors for women as well and there has been the cases where men has been good mentors for me uh, as specifically so if that kind of guidance and that kind of support is provided to them, that could be very helpful. And second uh, thing is, women are somehow up, afraid of asking for support. So that is also one big thing for us. So somehow, because from the start, we we have been brought up like that in our culture that we, we are always kind of, I would think, uh, we try to do multitasking and we, we think we can do everything. So that, that's the kind of mindset that we have. So asking for support becomes difficult. And when, when you are married, so it becomes more difficult. So that's the kind of thing. So should I ask this word for, from my home? Should I ask for support in my office? So that, that becomes a big bar barrier for a woman at the middle age. And so if there's a bar barrier at that age, and if, if at that age itself, they start dropping off, how would they reach the top level? So that is the kind of thing I, I think if uh, right mentorship, right facilities are provided to them, wherein their children take care could be done, maybe their parents, like surroundings are built like that. So they, they could rise to that level. Yeah, I would like to add one thing here, uh, like uh, Pooja has mentioned that uh, somebody who has a dual responsibility and seeking help again becomes a question to whom to ask for support. But uh, at the same time, being a single woman, asking for support is also not always taken in the right way, you know. So a lot of time when a single woman approaches a male uh, peer or a mentor for support, the, the interpretation is a lot of times taken in a negative way, you know. And that's also become a deterrent in a lot of women could uh, restrict themselves from asking for support, maybe because it will be interpreted in a different manner. So that also becomes one of the reasons why women are a little hesitant. Uh, and uh, one another thing that would, I would like to add is that gender pay gaps still exist. While uh, a, a eligible male as well as women contender would be there for a particular position, the the opportunities are still quite available for a male uh, male counterpart, whereas 
females would not be given that chance uh, very openly and uh, likewise remunerations also are still not at par for both the genders that's also one of the major things that still exist so i'll yeah. add to what uh, you know shweta and uh, pooja have already mentioned so uh, one aspect definitely you know the policies of the organization so what kind of policies and environment the organization is giving for supporting women like whether it is giving flexible hours like i have been with my organization for almost 16 17 years and i can think of you know being uh, here for another 17 years why because i get the flexibility to work i get the you know leadership opportunities so uh, you know that's that's where i feel the environment of the organization and the policies really play a key role uh, secondly um, uh, the will power of the women themselves like you know whether i want to accept this role how much do i want to do for myself what is my will power do i think everything is impossible or do i think everything uh, impossible means i am possible what is the uh, say out of it so you know once you start feeling that you know you want to go ahead and you want to do it if you have that strong will uh, like pooja said you will go ahead you will ask for support you will find the right kind of mentors there would be challenges there would be hindrances uh, but you know for me i would see them as opportunities to grow to learn to understand what to do but i'll not be pushed back or i would not be so so you know when i started going to events as a speaker the reason why i started going to events was because i went to two events and i saw that on the panels there was no women in in the whole panel there was i mean in the entire event there was no women so that's that made me uh, feel that you know people perceive that women don't understand security but i think that's the perception that needs to be broken down that that's where you need to tell people that we know security we understand that and that's where it's like more of a will power as well on how much we want to do and how much we want to grow as as women yeah and i think uh, what i lad is possibly in technology the uh, the pressure is higher because for, you know the business is today running entirely on the uh, technology so it's not just a 9 by 5 job but sometimes it is even a 24 by 7 job because you will need to ensure that your systems are up and running for uh, you know 24 hours and that is one of the reasons also that you know the the women would consider you know a career in technology means you know a, a 24 by 7 type of an availability that the organization would definitely expect in case uh, you know if it is required that is the uh, one the other thing i think is uh, women also expect a lot from themselves i think uh, the kind of uh, you know uh, levels we or the benchmarks we set for ourselves are so high that at sometimes we tend to take uh, a lot of stress you know uh, to manage those kind of outcomes so i think it's, it's uh, equally important that we understand that there are things which are in our control there are things which are not in our control so at times it's okay uh, if you don't really perform up to your own expectations and it's uh, and things will will fall in place uh, at some point but i think uh, one should not take so much of stress on themselves also or uh, one should not fear that uh, just uh, because of that and uh, you know not come into the uh, uh, leadership level i think uh, that's what i would do and just to you know uh, uh, shobhna so just to you know uh, ag- i agree to that point and just to add there i think one uh, major thing is that you know we as women uh, like like she said that we benchmark ourselves so high that we do not talk about our achievements so much you know we don't go and tell or publicize our achievements uh, as you know our other counterparts would do so i think that's one thing that we should really do and we appreciate each other and you know the way uh, we go and talk about the achievements that we have done besides what we do at home <coughs> no, 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 point actually sorry i'll interrupt you jatin yeah, so yeah. like mitali just mentioned so uh, talking about our achievements or talking about your uh, salary your remunerations or your uh, you're sitting in the board so this this actually is somewhat a problem which i think i faced for myself also and i am sure we all must be facing so we we are somewhere shy as compared to what men are and that's that's also some of the reasons why women want to be at that middle level or maybe at the level of manage senior managers in gm instead of asking to be placed in the board to face that kind of heat so that is also there yeah, and no. i recently was uh, you know reading one article in uh, economic times or the times of india so shweta that point of yours which you talk about the salary difference in the genders 
uh, I think government is coming up with those kinds of uh, regulations where it is talking about, uh, you know, the equal pay uh, structure for uh, men and women. I don't know how much that will come into effect, but yes, at least people have started talking about it, which is a good thing. So thanks. Thanks a lot <clears throat> for your great thoughts. Uh, in fact, on a hilarious note, I would just share an instance where <clears throat> I was I was part of a team uh, in the middle management where uh, there were 14 girls and only two boys. So <laughs> I used to feel very hesitant to share <clears throat> my expectation because there were all women around me. <laughs> And I used to feel very isolated. So yeah, I mean that that could happen with any uh, any of the gender. But I mean some some really pertinent points you have shared. Thank you very much for bringing up all those things in our discussion. Nisha, over to you. And uh, before we wrap up, thank you very much. Thank you, Jatinda, for getting more into it. So now we have Shweta from Matrix. So hi, Shweta. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Hi. We, we know that in 2024, we are like digitally, branding is a very important thing. So when we talk about a brand, personal branding, so how do you envision this thing and what tips would you like, you would like to give the IT leaders and other people around? Without a doubt, uh, personal branding is extremely important as part of my any communication, uh, it is influenced by the perceptions, perceptions of people the, whom you are conversing with. Uh, you may have best of ideas and suggestions, but likelihood of them being heard depends on people's perception about you. Uh, for the longest time, we technical people are anyways uh, quite binary in nature. So we, we generally talk in the terms of zeros and ones, whereas uh, it, it Totally depends on whether the person is interested in listening to your ideas and how effective is the way that you are communicating your ideas to the person, uh, the target audience. So uh, in my initial years, I used to believe that my hard, way, hard work is something that is going to take me to the top. Uh, it is very late that I realized uh, that since I wasn't focusing too much on my interaction with people and wasn't too active socially, people around me were not able to appreciate the work that I did. Uh, and that is when I realized that while I will still need to work hard and deliver, I additionally need to manage my personal brand. I started investing time and thoughts to improvise my communication and interaction with peers. And that's when people got to know the real me. It's important, extremely important to be visible. To be visible to those who need to be aware of your contribution, your intellect and your potential. Uh, this attracts more knowledge, opportunities and learnings at the same time. You get to explore more about your own unique personality traits. Uh, while I'm not an expert in this domain, but definitely a few things I would like to share based my personal experience. Uh, one needs to start uh, with the understanding of your own current brand and set a goal where you want to be. Start by acquiring the skills which can take you towards that objective. Uh, while you do the introspection, you can also collect feedback from people around you. And uh, a very cliched question, which is generally asked by interviewers is, tell me about yourself. Now the response to this is what defines your brand. Prepare the response and work towards it. And uh, last but not the least, uh, increase your interactions with acquaintances and strangers and see if the narrative is changing and keep tweaking it based on the feedbacks and responses that you get. Great, great, great. I totally agree. Like uh, nowadays, vis being visible, especially on the social media, uh, either it's about your work or your work life or your, uh, or your personal life being visible or um, keep making yourself that you are present at every sphere. That's a nice, good thing. And that's a, an important. Absolutely. Thing. Thank you so much. Thanks. So this was it from like for the, all the panelists. So I would like to all the panelists like Shobhna, you, Shweta, Mitali, and uh, I would say just a second, uh, Pooja. 
one word message do you want to convey to the women yeah, women uh, who are uh, aspiring for to look uh, into this it field who are like looking forward to work in technology shobhna we will start with you okay i think uh, i'll say that the destination is fantastic and uh, while you travel to the destination enjoy the journey uh, to the destination thank you shobhna Shweta, I would say that uh, I think we've already discussed this that we should start celebrating ourselves and uh, we shouldn't shy away from seeking for support and help. We should learn from others' experience. Thank you, Shweta. Uh, Pooja, I would like to say that uh, women, you can just do what you want to do. Just start believing in yourself. and i am sure you will reach the heights what even you have not expected for so that's my message thank you uh, mitali i think mitali has dropped she has dropped a message that she had a call okay okay so okay thank you a huge thank you to our panelists and everyone who joined us today your insights and experience are crucial in breaking barriers and empowering women in tech let's keep supporting and inspiring each other aiming for a more inclusive and equitable tech industry so happy women's day and here's to empowering women in tech today and every day thank you so much happy women thank you happy women's day